finally speaks after they've made all their speeches, God says, where were you when the worlds were formed? And, and how do you know? And, and how did you learn so much? And by the time you get through with that, you realize that God is too big. Yes, sir. Like way too big. Like you can't reason with God. Because he's too big. Do you realize that if you had one day at the helm of God's throne, you wouldn't know what to do with that. <laughs> I mean, if he just said, all right, I'm going to move over, you run the world for just a little while. Read, brother. Read, brother. Man, you'd have to know a little more. You'd have to know where a cow calved last night. You would have to know where an ant crawled. You would have to know everything on the inside and the outside of every person in the whole world. You'd know how to take death in Lakeland and affect somebody in New York. You'd have to learn how to do all of that. <coughs> and you don't know enough so that when God comes along to say, Job, where were you and how much do you know? You'd have to acknowledge God's too big for me. Let me try to explain something and then I'll finish it. You know, I think God could explain everything that he's doing. I mean, I've been impressed for a long time with the fact that God did care enough to answer. That when Job finally raises all of his questions, God does answer. Now, the reason I'm impressed with that is because I don't think God has to answer any of us. He can do what he wants to and never say a thing to you because he doesn't have to. But he cared enough to answer. I'm impressed with that. Yes. And I think he could explain. My guess, though, is if God explained everything he's doing today, we don't have a single person in here who can really understand it. Because it's too big. But this we do know about that God who cares. That Job's friends were wrong so many times. That's why I keep saying, every time you read about an Eliaphaz speech, you need to go back and read the prologue. Because they almost start by saying, Job, you've done some secret sin. What you need to do is come straight. And the book of Job starts saying, this is a perfect man, an upright man, a man who serves God. And so they're repeatedly wrong. Here's the one that... I'm, I'm most interested in. You know, almost always, Job and his friends, in the context of trouble, wind up saying God's punishing Job. Why is God punishing Job? Why is God punishing Job? Here's an answer that I want you to remember. God's not punishing Job. God's actually protecting Job. That if it had not been for God, Satan would have killed Job a long time ago. Well, sure enough, it's God who puts the limits on, who says you can go this far and no farther. You can actually touch him, but you can't kill him. You can take what he has, but you cannot touch him. It's God who protects us in the soul. And you want to know something else? If you read the epilogue, the end of the book, yes, sir. you'll figure out God wasn't punishing him. Yes, sir. He was planning for him. This God who gets accused of punishing actually protects us. Yes. And the God who gets accused at times of punishing is actually planning something better for Job. Can you appreciate a God who knows so much more than you? <laughs> who plans for you in the midst of your trouble? Who protects you in the midst of your trouble? 
who is actually taking care of you when you don't even know he's taking care of you. A part of what would make me go somewhere and sit down is if I talked a whole lot of noise and said, I need to talk to God. I wonder why God is doing this. I want to talk to God. And finally I got where God is. And explained to me gently, I was protecting you all along. If I hadn't protected you, Satan would have killed you. And while he was trying to kill you, I was planning something better for you. In that context, I would go somewhere and sit down. I don't know where I'm leaving you this morning. I was trying to leave you thinking God has truly been good to us. Amen. I wanted to leave you saying, I'm thankful for every gift that I've had. Yes. Yes. And I'm going to take that gift and use it to the best of my ability as long as ever I live. Yes. There may be people among us who are not Christians. Maybe you've been here, heard the gospel preached from several different people, and maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel yet. And you need to do something about that. You can only be saved by doing the will of God. If you are not a Christian, you can become a Christian. If you believe in Jesus, if you're willing to repent of your sins, to make a confession with your mouth, you can be buried with Christ in baptism for the remission of your sins. Yeah, you say, well, Gregory, I, 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 I know I, I might not have done it exactly like that, but I'm a Christian. That's why you need to come all the rest of the week. I'll show you that you can't be saved without doing the will. No, sir. No, sir. And you can't argue with Jesus about that. He's too big for you. If you're already a Christian, but you haven't been faithful, why don't you come home? A good way to start a gospel meeting yes. is by people recommitting themselves and deciding to be faithful to the Lord. I hope you'll decide to support the gospel meeting, to come every night, yes. bring somebody with you, Amen. and let's spread the word of God. Amen. If you're subject to the invitation, we bid you to come this morning as we stand together. And as we sing our song. There's a fountain free. And to be baptized while they're getting her ready as guest of my sister Smith. Williams. Uh, so we want to know. Also Amos in the direction of evangelism. I thought the morning sermon was a way to start as we kind of remember and move, and I'm hoping this sermon, uh, that I call Gather Up the Fragments. Gather Up the Fragments will kind of turn us and get us ready for another week of study. This is how I'm going to do it. We'll work through John 6, and that's where we'll work the hardest. And once we've worked all the way through John 6, using the Jeremiah 8 text included in that, then we're going to raise three questions about why people are really lost. And once we get through those questions, I have a challenge for you, and that will be our sermon for this afternoon. Look in John 6 and just start at verse number 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was not. 
when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company. Now, just for a minute, underline in verse number two, a great multitude followed him. Underline in verse number five, a great company. And you might just observe verse number four, that this is about the time of the Passover, a feast of the Jews. The only reason I mention the Passover is because I'm trying to get to this feeding of the 5,000, but Jesus wants to do something in this context that turns people's mind to the need to honor a different Passover lamb. Yes, yes. They know Passover. They know the history of Passover. But he's needing them to honor this climactic Passover with a new Passover lamb. So just thinking, a great multitude follows him, a great company, and it's about the time of the Jewish Passover. Verse number five. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And I want to stop there again just to kind of keep you abreast of what's going on. I want you to appreciate what's really happening in the context of a coming Passover. We've got a new Passover lamb, great company, multitude, following Jesus. Jesus looked at that great multitude and decided, I'm going to do something. Yes, sir. It's just interesting. I, I'm going to do something. Now, he already knows what he's going to do because the Bible says he knew what he was going to do. All right. But he starts it like this. Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? Yes, sir. And he raised the question. See, it's an odd question. But Jesus knew what he was going to do. Yes, yeah. Philip said, if we had several thousand dollars, a denarii is equal to a labor for a full day. So if we had most of the annual wages of one man, we don't have enough money to buy food to feed all of these people. All right. And Andrew almost flippantly chanted, chimed in. We got a little boy's lunch. As if to say, what are we going to do with a little boy's lunch? It's a reflection of their doubt. We're not going to feed these people. We don't have enough money to feed these people. We don't have enough food to feed these people. What are we going to do with all of these people? And Jesus, in a very interesting way, knew their doubt. But, don't forget, he already knew what he would do. So he said, sit down. Tell the men to sit down. It's almost a challenging response to the flippancy of Andrew and the, the no faith of Philip. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. Verse number 10, Jesus said,
said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. That's where I get the title. Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together, filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And I think y'all underline 14. When those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is a truth, that prophet that should come. Sometimes when I keep pointing up that Jesus knew what he would do. He already knew what he would do. Sometimes people say, well, what, what, what was he planning to do? He was planning to give them a sign that would make them know that he is the Son of God. And so when they said, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough food, he took a little boy's lunch, multiplied that, and fed 5,000 men as much as they wanted. And they ate until they were filled. I just point that up because I remember the doubt in Philip and Andrew. I, I remember them saying, we don't have enough money to buy enough for everybody to get a little bite. And then you get down here and Jesus has done something and, and everybody's full. And when they were filled, he told them, gather up the fragments so that nothing is actually lost. Now, what's interesting here is that he wants them to gather the fragments that nothing is lost. And uh, then uh, he makes a few other points that I want us to get as we work through this. He saw that they were going to try to make him some kind of king, so he departed and went to a mountain by himself. When he was missing, he later came back and gave them another sign. Don't forget them. Gave them another sign. He actually walked on the water, and the twelve saw that. And then uh, when they finally found him, they got into a discussion, verse number 26. He says, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Underline 27. Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? He said, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom God hath sent. They said, But we need a sign. Jesus could almost say to them, What in the world do you mean you need a sign? You just saw signs that's almost unbelievable. But he didn't respond like that. They said, our fathers gave us a sign. In the middle, he said, your fathers didn't give you that manna. My father gave you that manna. And now he's given you the true bread. Yes, sir. Verse 33, I like. For the bread of God is he. Right. As Jesus went saying, I am the bread. Yes, sir. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, but you don't believe me. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that Everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now I want you to appreciate those little changes. Gather up the fragments so that nothing is lost. What do you mean, Lord? Labor not for that food that perishes. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Yes. A couple of other points before we get to the practical side to this. One, I'm wanting you to remember that I think he's talking primarily about the twelve. That although this is a general miracle for everybody, I think the people that Jesus really, really wanted to convince were the twelve. Great company started following him. Great multitude about the time of the Passover. He's wanting them to appreciate a different Passover lamb. Wants everybody to know it, but he's got to convince the 12. So I'm going to do a miracle in front of the 12. Philip, what do you think? Andrew, what do you think? 12, what do you think? And then he showed them a sign. I'm the Son of God. He walked on the water. I'm the Son of God. Moses didn't give you that bread. My Father gave you that bread. I am the bread. I am the Son of God. Yes. Man. A little later in John 6, he makes it stronger and stronger. You've got to partake of this bread. It's not optional. You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have nothing to do with me. In other words, you've got to so believe in me, and this has got to become so meaningful to you that it actually impacts how you live. And if that doesn't happen, you cannot be my disciple. And the multitudes started dropping off. You know, there are a lot of people who will follow Jesus until they find out what Jesus is really about. I've noticed that in church. And you know, I'm pretty sure it's true with denominationalism. You'll just have to evaluate it yourself. But there are a lot of groups that as long as people can do whatever they want to, whenever they want to, people will follow them. And they grow large churches. Talk about just love the Lord. Just, just, just be good to each other. Just, just, just do what you want to and play like you're going to church. And, 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 and. But man, when Jesus comes along and starts saying, you can't do that. You've got to do that this way. Man, Jesus talked so strong that the multitude stopped following he didn't make it any different. He said, I'm still the Son of God. And what if you see me go back to heaven where I came from? Do you realize that a little later he caught a cloud and went back and people watched him go out of sight? What if you see that? Will you believe I'm the Son of God then? He talked so strong that many left him 
and went back and wouldn't follow him any further. This is why Daniel's the 12, you see. He finally turned to the 12 at the end of that chapter and said, will you also go away? That's when Peter made that great confession. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you had just a little time, I would tell you to turn to John 17 and underline because he says, while I was with them in the world, talking about the 12, it's a part of his prayer. While I was with them, where I, those that you gave me, I kept, and none of them I lost. A little later he says that son of perdition named Judas, but of all, that's the only one I lost. He's got to, con got to get the 12 actually convinced because when he goes back, the 12 has to go out into the world. I heard a fictitious story, just a fictitious story. Uh, Jesus went back to heaven and was telling them about his trip to earth. And somebody said, Lord, did you do what you planned? Yeah, I did all of that. Then what did you tell everybody? He said, no, I left 12 men. And I told them to tell everybody. So what if they fail? He said, I have no other plan. He's got to convince the 12. And those 12 are really convinced. Now here's the message that I'm wanting you to think through. Why are those people lost in the context of the Savior, Jesus, walking with them? And gather up the fragments so that nothing is lost. I didn't lose anything but one. Labor not for that food that perishes. This is the Father's will, that of everything that he's given me, I lose nothing. I'm suggesting to you that there may be 12 baskets of fragments because of the 12. All right. Anybody would figure out pretty quickly, wouldn't you, that somebody who can multiply a little boy's lunch to enough fragments to have 12 baskets could make as many baskets of fragments as he wanted to make. So why 12? These 12 apostles. And I've already tried to point out something to him. They ate as much as they wanted. And when they were filled. All right, now here you are. You, me, we're an apostle. You've got a basket of fragments. You're already full. And you gather up the fragments. And here you are with your basket full of fragments. What are you going to do? with your fragment. Right. What are you planning to do with that basket? I'm suggesting that an apostle standing there with a basket of fragments would have to recognize some things. He would have to stand there and say, that man named Jesus has to be the Son of God. in my mind about where the fragments came from. And he has to acknowledge that here I stand with my basket of fragments and I don't need to worry about whether I can get some more. So I'm full. I know I can get some more because he can make some more. And he has to be the Son of God because he couldn't have done this if he hadn't been the Son of God. And I think that challenge is to so believe that and so believe him that they take a message to an entire world of lost people. Yes, sir. But as you go, you've got to think about why they're lost. And I want to make three suggestions for you, and you'll have the lesson. Number one, I want to suggest that people
people are lost because they simply do not know where they are. All right. I can just think about the term lost. We've all been lost at some point in our lives. When, when you've been in some place or you were trying to figure out where you really were, and in that kind of context, we just didn't know where we really were. We were lost from a physical perspective. 